1 John chapter 3. <clears throat> We're going to kind of pick up where we left off, do a little review uh, before we uh, get into um, something new tonight. We've been talking about, John is talking in his letter about true faith, how faith manifests itself. And we know that one thing that we keep reading over and over and over again in this little letter, we keep seeing the word love. Love. The love that God has for us and the love that we should have one for another. It's an agape love. It's not uh, a feeling love. It's not a, a romantic love. It's, it's a giving love. John is telling us that if we're truly born again, we're going to have a penchant for loving. And tonight, we're going to reread what we finished with last week in chapter 3 and verse 1. And it's important because we want to lay a foundation for what we're going to talk about tonight. And it's important that we lay the right foundation because if, if, you, if you don't get the right foundation, then you won't get the, you won't get the right understanding. We begin in 1 John chapter 3 where it says, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore, the world knows us not because it knew him not. It says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that has this hope in himself purifies himself even as he is pure. Now, behold what manner of love. Just look. Just, can, you, can you just imagine the kind of love that God has for us? And remember I said that this, this isn't, it's the same word, but it's not the same idea where it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. That love was a love given to all those whosoever would believe on him should not perish. That's a love offered to the sinner, the gift of salvation offered to the sinner through faith in Christ. But the love that he's talking about here is much more than that kind of love. It's it's a love the father has for a son. A love that no one can imitate, that you can't buy, you can't work up. Family love, just a love that's, that's immeasurable. And can only come from a relationship. You can only have this kind of love if you have a relationship. So what this is talking about, the relationship that we have with the Father through faith in Christ, is a relationship of a son. Now it says elsewhere that we've been given the spirit of adoption. We've been adopted into the family of God, but that adoption is a completely legal adoption. It's a complete takeover of one's inheritance. We become his. And he says that we're the sons of God and we don't, we don't know what we're going to look like yet when we get there, but we're going to be like him because we shall see him as he is. What a promise that we have. Because of the love that the Father has for us through Christ, we're going to lay our eyes on Jesus. We've never seen him up front. The pictures, forget, they don't do justice. That's not, that's not him. We don't know what he looks like, but we know we're going to see him. And it says that every man that has this hope in himself, what? Purifies himself even as he is pure. So, What John is telling us in the foundation for what we're going to read here tonight is this idea of our relationship. See, it's important that we keep that as a foundation because if we don't and we start going into this topic that we're going to go into, the topic of sin, if we don't have that idea of a relationship, then we can fall into a legalism that would be deadly. Okay, So those first three verses establish a foundation. We're his sons. We're going to see him as he is someday. And if we have this in us, 
If we have this hope in us, it's going to naturally generate within us a desire to do what he wants us to do, to be more like him, to be holy, to be righteous, to do what's right. That's an evidence of being a follower of Jesus Christ. Okay, now, listen to what he says. Here we go. Whosoever commits sin transgresses also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. Everyone who sins is breaking the law. When you sin, whether it be a big sin or a little sin, you know, we, we categorize, we compartmentalize sins. We say, you know, floor one is just like minor sins. Second floor is, and third floor is like the real bad ones. Okay. So we have like different sin departments. Well, I'm okay if I stay on the first floor. That's not too bad. But if I get up on the third floor, look out. But the Bible tells us that all sin is transgression of the law. And it's important for us to understand what, when he uses the term law, and when, they, when we see this term law in the New Testament, what it means. Well, the law he's speaking of here is the moral law of the Old Testament. We, we encapsulate that law in the Ten Commandments. We all had to learn the Ten Commandments. Did you have to learn the Ten Commandments when you were kids? We learned the Ten Commandments. The first four commandments deal with our relationship to God, and the last six deal with our relationship to one another. And then there are a lot of other commandments after that that make up the law, different things that all through the, old, you know, the, the, the book of Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy. The law was given. And it says in the Word, if you break just one of them things, you, you know, you break the whole thing. It's not, you know, it, it, there's like not points. Like if you break this one, it's five points, and this one, it's ten. If you break the law, you break the law. Jesus, when he gave his Sermon on the Mount, said, you know, the law says thou shalt not kill. But if you hate your brother, in God's eyes, not necessarily in man's eyes. But in God's eyes, that's sin. Hating is a sin like murder. And to us, we say, well, hating, you know, you can hate somebody, but it's not as bad. But it's still sin. It's still sin. He says, whosoever commits sin transgresses also the law. There are two extremes when you talk about the law. One extreme is legalism. Where people teach that salvation depends upon your adherence to a, a list of things, performance standards, or the law. These are the groups that say you have to be baptized. These are the groups that say you have to, you know, take communion in their church. These are the groups that say you have to talk in tongues. These are the groups that say you have to, you know, do this and do that. People that lay a whole lot of standards and, and uh, rules and, and laws that govern, and you have to follow them to the T. And if you don't, then you're not, you can't be part of their, their group. And you can't please God unless you've been baptized, unless you, you know, pay your tithes. Unless you, and there's a list of things that's legalism. And there's some that take the Old Testament laws, or some of them, they don't take all of them. But they'll take like the Old Testament dietary laws, and they'll say, you shouldn't eat shrimp. You shouldn't eat lobster. I don't eat lobster anyhow. You shouldn't eat, uh, you know, uh, pork. Oh, Lord, no bacon. I mean, they say these things. And they say, if you eat these things, you're transgressing the law, and you're going to sin. One, one group says, if you worship on Sunday, you're going to end up going to hell. You know, so they have all these, all these rules and things that you've got to follow. They're legalistic. And when they're legalistic like that, they deny the efficacy of the blood of Jesus Christ. The other extreme is the one that says, I'm saved by grace. I can do whatever I want to do because the blood of Jesus cleanses me from all sin. So I can just go ahead and do whatever and say, I'm sorry, God. And it's a blank check. The Apostle Paul said, shall we sin that grace may abound? God forbid. These are the extremes. That's called antinomialism. That's a big, long word. And it just means we don't care what God said because we're living by grace. 
But how many know that extremes are just that? You get one extreme over here and one extreme over here, and the real thing is right in the middle. Now listen, there is not a law, there is not an act that you can do that can make you worthy of salvation. Not a single one of us. <laughs> Whether we preach or teach or we can live our lives. The Apostle Paul talked about in Philippians. He said, man, as I was a Pharisee. It's touching the law. I was blameless. He said, if anybody could get into heaven by living right, it was me. He said, it wasn't working for me. And it won't work for you. But God gives us the law for the purpose of teaching us how he expects us to live. Let's read a little bit more. <clears throat> and you know, verse 5, And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. 6. Whosoever abides in him sins not, Whosoever sins has not seen him, neither known him. Now, we read this and we say, oh, does that mean if I blow it, I don't know him? You have to understand how these words are presented and the, and the, 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 uh, the grammar What he's talking about is the habit of our lives. Now, how many people here have ever had a bad habit? How many people have a bad habit right now? <laughs> Habits are things we do almost automatically. Things that we do just Naturally. They say it takes about 21 days to develop a habit. I don't know. I've been able to do it a whole lot quicker. <laughs> a habit can become an addiction. An addiction is a habit that takes control of you. It's a habit. What he's talking about here is not the times when we blow it. He's talking about how we live. If we live in such a way that we're not convicted of sin or don't even try to keep from sinning, then we need to take a good examination of our relationship with Jesus Christ. Am I truly a son of God if I can sin with impunity and not be convicted and not try to address that, or not try to change that. You see, it really, it really bothers me and concerns me when people come and tell me that they're saved, yet they live their lives in such ways that are not glorifying to God without any type of conviction, or without any type of feeling of, you know, this isn't right. We all have bad habits. Some of us have addictions. And we struggle. There are people that struggle with them. You see, we, I, I wanted to lay that foundation because when we talk about God's love for us, it's not a condemning love. It's a changing love. If you have the spirit of adoption within you, if you have been bought with a price, then you're going to have within you a desire to live the way God wants you to live. That means that when you're confronted with these habits and these lifestyles, you will call upon the Holy Spirit. You will call upon whatever you need to call upon to help you to change and be the person God wants you to be. Conviction is a wonderful indication of how saved you really are. Some folks get afraid of being convicted. Don't be afraid to be convicted of your sins. That's a wonderful thing. Because that means God is saying, hey, this is, some, this is an area of your life that you need to bring to the cross, that you need to get under the blood, that you need to bring to me, that you need to allow the Holy Spirit to begin to work in you, to change you. He says, in verse 6, <clears throat> Whoso abides in him sins not. Whosoever sins has not seen him, neither known him. And he's talking about practicing or living the habit of sin. 
Little children, let no man deceive you. He that does righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that commits sin is of the devil, for the devil sins from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. If we read this without laying the foundation of God's love in us and God's spirit in us, we'll, there, there won't be anybody in here, I think, who would say, man, I, maybe I ain't saved. But you have to understand God's power, the Holy Spirit within us, convicts us, teaches us, shows us, helps us grow, matures us. That's called the process of sanctification. I've said this before that many, there are those who think sanctification is a one act deal. I'm sanctified. But sanctification is a lifelong process. To those who are really His, God will deal with you about those areas of your life that aren't glorifying to Him. And if you're not being dealt with something, see, I always tell folks if you're not being convicted, it might be something small. It might be on the first floor. It might be on the eighth floor. It might, wherever it might be, whatever department I'm by in, it might be in. If God is not convicting, if the Holy Spirit's not dealing with you with something in your life, because every one of us got something we got to deal with. Is it just me? We all do. Habits. Sometimes our habits are things that we put in. And sometimes our habits are things that come out. Huh? Our attitudes. What do we find ourselves gravitating to? The Apostle Paul deals with this in a lot of places. And we're going to look at a couple passages uh, tonight just to, just, to, just to kind of ingrain this in us. Because I want you all to understand, children of God, if you're a child of God, then God's going to do everything, the Holy Spirit's going to do everything he can to help you change. And we don't live any longer to sin, but we live to righteousness. Over in Galatians, Paul's letter to the Galatians chapter 5. And... Um, <clears throat> Verse 16, I think. <laughs> I'm sorry, verse 13. Listen to what Paul says. Brethren, you have been called unto what? Liberty. The gospel doesn't enslave us, it sets us free. But it doesn't set us free to sin, it sets us free from sin. Listen to what he says. Brethren, you have been called unto liberty, only use not that liberty for an occasion to the flesh. That's what we talked about, those who were the antinomialism, who said, hey, man, I'm free, I'll just do whatever I feel like doing. Paul says, don't use your liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love... There's that word again. Serve one another. For all the law, here we go, talking about the law. All the law is fulfilled in one word, even this. Ten commandments, all the 300 some other commandments there were, it's all wrapped up in this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. That's hard. Because sometimes our neighbors aren't very lovable. And sometimes our neighbors might not see us as very lovable. L loving, John said that God loved us and we have a, you know, behold what manner of love the Father has shown unto us. That love is given to us so we can love in return. 
He says, For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But if you bite and devour one another, take heed that you be not consumed one of another. Paul had to deal with that in those days, just like we, I mean, people have not, not changed in 2,000 years. Because one of the bad habits we get into, we might not smoke, we might not drink, we might not smoke crack, we might not take drugs. But I found, and even in myself, I have a bad habit sometimes of getting ticked off at people that rattle my chain. Come on. You must be honest. Somebody pokes you in the side with their elbow. Now, I've done that once or twice myself. You know. I used to be a wise, wise cracker. I, I was. My mouth got me in trouble a lot more times than what I'd like to admit. And that's a habit. I find myself even today sometimes having to hold my tongue because I'll say something. It might make somebody mad. Just kidding around. But, oh, you got to watch kidding around. <laughs> he says in verse 16, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Paul is telling us this because we have a choice as believers. How do we walk? How do we live? We're confronted every day with choices. I wish that God could have just pushed the button and changed everything on the inside. But there's a certain aspect of this Christian walk that demands that I make an effort to live a life that's glorifying to God. Not to be saved. My, my salvation is based on the blood of Jesus. I can't add to that. This, this isn't making us more saved than somebody else. This isn't making us any more a son of God than we are through faith in the blood of Jesus Christ. But this is the growth process. This is the part where God is making us, conforming us to the image of his son. And we can either cooperate, we can either make that effort or sit back. And listen, the more we resist the move of God, the more we, we resist his working in our lives, we're just going to be left behind. That doesn't mean we're going to lose our salvation or end up in, you know, in hell, but we're going to miss all the blessings that God can give to us. If we continually resist the Holy Spirit's drawing. This is why Paul says, walk in the Spirit. That's a command. That's a choice. We can either choose to walk in the Spirit or walk after the flesh. Verse 17, for the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. That battle, we all know what that battle is. My body has not been redeemed yet. My spirit's brand new. I'm born again. I'm a new creature. But I'm in this body that is still flesh. And there's a battle that goes on. And whether that, whoever, whoever wins the battle is who I feed and who I nourish and who I nurture. Read a few more verses. We're going to look at something else. Uh, For the flesh less against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. These are contrary to one another. So that you cannot do the things that you would. There's just some things we can't do. Oh, we, can, we can't. We can do them. <laughs> but we shouldn't. But if you be led of the spirit, you are not under the law. See, if we learn to walk in the Spirit, we don't have to worry about the law. It says because the Spirit's in our heart. The law of God is written on the inside. And as children of God, sons of God, behold the manner of, uh, what manner of love God has bestowed upon us that we should be called sons of God. We have that Spirit in us. We have that access to the Spirit that if we yield ourselves to Him, we will walk as God wants us to walk. Okay? And he goes on and talks about the uh, manifestations of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit. And that's a good thing to read. But I, I want to look at one more passage of Scripture. Over in 1 Corinthians, chapter 6. And starting at verse 9. Now these are some very defining statements that Paul is making here, just like what John said. Listen to what he says. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom 
of God. Or the unrighteous might not inherit it. Or the unrighteous will, you know, no. When he's talking about the unrighteous, he's talking about those that do not have a right relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ. He says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. See, there's a lot of people who who have been deceived about this. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. It doesn't maybe not, might not, well, maybe there'll be an open door, or maybe they have a chance. It's like, no. People that, ha- that practice this lifestyle, people that live these lifestyles, that have been sold over to these lifestyles in the flesh, people that have these habits... will not get into heaven. And he goes on and he says this, but such were some of you. Who, me? Where does your name fit in to that that list? Fits in somewhere. Because before I was saved, I was a lot of them things, not all of them, (laughs) okay. I was a lot of them things. Before I was saved, that was me. And I was on my way to hell. But now that I'm saved, you know what? The temptation's still there. Temptation's still there. Well, I'm never tempted to look at a woman. I'm never tempted to go in a bar somewhere and take a drink. I'm never tempted... The temptation is still there. And my flesh still wouldn't mind a little bit of that. So what do I have to do? This is where we get to the cross. This is where, you know, if the blood is able to save us, you know what? It's able to keep us. He says, and such were some of you, but... You are washed, but you are sanctified, but you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. When I got saved, my position with God had changed. I became a son of God through faith in Jesus Christ. Before I quit this and before I quit that, and while I was still doing this, my salvation was assured by what Jesus did on the cross. Then God began a work in me. And this is what Paul says. Listen to what he says. All things are lawful unto me. Whoa, cool. (laughs) I can do anything I want, right? But all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power. There's that habit. There's the addiction. There's the control. I will not be brought under the power of any. Verse 13. Meats for the belly and the belly for meats. But God shall destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for fornication but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. It's interesting that the two things he focuses on is food and sex. What are the two driving forces They say the desire for food and the desire for sexual relations. They say they're almost equal in the human consciousness. And God has both raised up the Lord and will also raise up us by his own power. Know ye not. Listen, now he's saying this to Christians. He's saying this to believers and he's, he's teaching them. He's saying this to believers who are caught up in things. These saints in Corinth, they had a lot of problems. When you read the letter, especially the first letter to the Corinthians, they had a lot of problems. 
As a matter of fact, they had a guy, a believer in, in there, that they had to put out for a while because he was, he was involved in a, in a really bad relationship with his stepmother. They had to put him out to see if he was really saved or not. We find out in a, in a, in a, in a later letter that he came back and they received him. But listen to what he says. Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Do you know that? Your bodies, this has become the temple of the Holy Spirit. This is where the Holy Spirit dwells. Believers. He says, Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of a harlot? God forbid. What? Know ye not that he which is joined to a harlot is one body? For two, says he, shall be one flesh. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Flee fornication. I mean, I, I, wish, I wish believers could get this etched in. I mean, we're hearing over and over and over again these, these churches and these pastors, and they get involved in illicit sexual relationships, and they shrug it off like it's nothing. These are pastors, leaders. God help us. God forgive us. The church that would allow these things to go on. And, and, and again, I'm not condemning anybody. You know, we're all human. They, they, might, they might fall. They might, you know, uh, get, get themselves caught up in something. But they act like it's no big deal. I have to question. Somebody get caught up in something like that and not be convicted. I got to question if they're saved. But we see it over and over and over again. John says, let's go back to John and just read a few more verses and we're going to close. <clears throat> let's just start at verse 8. Again. Let, uh, look, at verse, look at verse 10. In this the children of God are manifest... And the children of the devil. Whoso does not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loves not his brother. For this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. We, keep this, we see this repeated over and over and over again. What should be the effect of salvation in the life of a believer? Is it going to make you perfect that you never make a mistake or never sin? That's not what he's saying here. But it's going to make you have a desire and a heart to want to live after God and want to be pure even as he is pure. This is the message that you heard from the beginning, verse 11, that we should love one another, not as Cain, who was of that wicked one and slew his brother. And wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil and his brother's righteous. James said it. Why do you have wars and fightings among you? Because you lust and you have not. Or you, you lust, you ask. Uh, you have not because you ask not. Or you ask and you ask amiss. You lust to, to consume it on your own flesh. Self-centeredness. He says in verse 13, Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death unto life because we what? Love the brother. He, John talks so much about love in his epistle. It's the key. If you don't have a desire, and I've said this before, you know, there's some people I might not necessarily like, but I, I, I love. Love is giving, it's not feeling, it's giving. And if God so loved us, behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, shouldn't we say, God, give me that kind of love? Man, it takes God to give us that kind of love. Just reading a little bit more. I'm not going to keep it long tonight at all. Verse 14. We know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loves not his brother abides in death. Whoso hates his brother is a, what? A murderer. Jesus said that. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. 
Hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoso has this world's good and sees his brother have need and shuts up his bowels of compassion upon him, how dwells the love of God in him? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and truth. It's easy to say I love you. It's kind of hard to prove it. There are some folks that have told me I love you, and I think to myself, man, <laughs> don't love me like that. You know. You ever feel that way? Somebody says, I love you, and you think, man, I sure hope you never hate me. Okay. All right. A few more verses, and we're going to close. We're going we're gonna to read, read just the rest of the, the chapter, and then we're done. Hereby, <clears throat> verse 19, Hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then have we confidence toward God. Listen, if we can get to the place where we can live our lives and feel confident toward God and feel I'm doing everything I can, yeah, we're going to blow it sometimes. Yeah, we're going to miss the mark sometimes. Yeah, we're going to transgress the law. But if our heart is toward God, we need to have confidence. He said earlier in his epistle, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to what? Forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's why when we read these passages, a lot of people will read these without the right foundation. And they'll think, man, how can I ever be saved? Because I can't go like three hours without sinning. But you see, it's not that perfection. It's the desire. Paul said in the, uh, the book of Philippians, working out your salvation with fear and trembling. Not to be saved. We can't work to be saved. But to grow in him and knowing, having an assurance that God, our Father, that showed us the love, behold what manner of love, would he withdraw that love from us because we make a mistake? Would you withdraw your love from your child because they made an error? How many of you have ever had a kid rebel against you? Do you stop loving them? He says in verse 22, Beloved, I'm sorry, verse 22, And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him, because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. God rewards obedience. And I have found, again, I'll just use my own experience, that when I find myself not receiving, when I find myself asking and not receiving, it's usually because there's something in my life that is not pleasing to God. There's something that he's dealing with me about. There's something that he wants me to address. There's something that he wants me to bring to the cross. There's something he wants me to get under the blood. Verse 23. And this is his commandment. That we should believe on the name of his son Jesus Christ and love one another as he gave us commandment. This chapter started out talking about, behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us. And it ends by saying that we should believe on his name and love one another. Everything is bookmarked with those. He loves us. We love one another. And in between, we learn and grow and live the way Jesus wants us to live. He that keeps his commandments dwells in him and he in him. And hereby we know that he abides in us by the spirit which he has given us. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called sons of God. He has not given us the spirit of fear, but the spirit of adoption, where we could cry, Abba, Father. 
and become sons and daughters of the Most High, reflecting His image, bearing His name, showing to all the world around us who He is by who we are. You perfect? Well, if you get to be perfect, teach me how. Because I don't think anybody in here has achieved that sinless perfection. I thank God that my salvation isn't based upon sinless perfection because I would be on my way to hell. But my, my salvation is based on the blood of Jesus Christ, the love that God has showed me. God, help me show love to others. There's some folks I don't really want to show love to. And there's some folks, listen, it says right here, don't be surprised. John said, don't be surprised if the world hates you. There's some folks you try to show them love, it'll bounce right off of them. Know what I'm talking about? Sometimes you try to show love and they'll turn around and bite you like a snake. That's all right. They did that to Christ. We don't show love to get results. We show love to be obedient. And see, if we learn how to show love, all those other things, the habits, the addictions, he'll take them. He'll take them. Behold, what manner of love the Father has shown to us that we should be called. I'm so glad I can be called the Son of God. I uh, was on the phone today with a friend of mine from years, years, years ago. Kids grew up together in high school. And he knew me before I was saved. And he was asking me about spiritual things. I was able to share with him. And I said, you remember what I was like? He said, yeah, I remember what you were like. <laughs> he knew me. We were close. Way back when. So I guess if, if folks had known me in the last 10 or 15 years, they could say, yeah, yeah, Pastor Carmen, yeah, he got his problems. You know. See, he knew me back when I was, you know, that stuff we read back in 1 Corinthians. He knew me when I was back in there. Do you remember when, have you ever met somebody, seen somebody you haven't seen in years, that when you, they knew you when you was back in there? And they look at you and say, wow. Sometimes that reminds you how far God has brought you. Sometimes we need to be reminded. Because we forget sometimes. But I thank God that he showed his love to me. And to you. And he made me a son of God. And you know what? It doesn't matter if tomorrow I would get on an airplane and fly to Mexico. And leave everything here. It doesn't matter. My salvation is assured by the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. I thank God for the Holy Spirit and his power that works within us. Anybody have any questions or comments?